everybody. Thanks for attending today's Lunch Bites seminar presented by Marco. Today we're going to be talking about physical security. We're going to talk a little bit about what trends are out in the market and really want to get down to what we're seeing being implemented today. Physical security, we're going to cover the what is it, what does it mean to folks, the what's the why's and the how's of physical security. Uh, there's a couple of folks. Mark Morozik is actually uh, remote, so I'll be doing most of the speaking here. My name is Todd Voida. My position is the director of our audio, video, and physical security divisions within Marco. So physical security, what is it? So according to Techopedia, it describes physical security describes the measures designed to ensure the physical protection of assets such as facilities, equipment, personnel, IT resources, and other properties from damage or unauthorized physical access. According to Totopedia, which is really based around our practice, what we're seeing in the field at our customers, and industry trends because we, we attend a number of the industry events and follow very closely. So it, what physical security really is in practice is protecting your people first and foremost, your employees, your customers, and visitors to your building, and secondarily, your assets. It's understanding your corporate concerns, vulnerabilities, and risks, and then building a, pan, a plan to resolve the, the risks, mitigate the risks, or accept the risks. Those are the three options, and you have to make a decision amongst each of those. Recognizing real and actual risks, ranking them, and then executing a plan to ensure the ability to layer and integrate is necessary for maximum protection. That's protection of your people, protection of your assets, as well as investment protection. And it really truly is an ongoing process. It will evolve throughout the year. So it's a plan that you're going to want to make sure you've written and you share it with your leadership of your group. So physical security, what is it to you? And that's really, we've got a number of different folks on the webinar today. Um, we've got financial folks in banking industry. We've got government folks. We've got education. We've got enterprise business. We have small business. So everybody has a common thread of what physical security is, but it's really driven, and your plan should be, what does it mean to you? So there's, there's a few areas here that we'll talk about. It looks like a little something's missing on the slide here, but we'll talk first and foremost is surveillance, video surveillance. That's typically what people first think about when they go to physical security. Cameras, where are you putting your cameras? What are you doing with your cameras? And then if you had it for a while and you've got a legacy system, you most likely have some analog components to it. We're not seeing much analog, we do see some analog devices out there for specific, very specific and particular reasons, but most likely as you implement new solutions or expand on your systems, you're going to be using IP devices, whether that's cameras or the other components that integrate into your video surveillance. <clears throat> and you've got to decide whether you replace them, whether you move them elsewhere in your business, and really what you're trying to accomplish that goes back to developing that plan. Are you doing it for slip and fall reasons? Are you want video because you're a retail business or a public business and you may be concerned about some litigation with, you know, you have a grocery store, people walk in, they slip and fall and are, are suing you. That's, that's a big reason that folks do it. Some, some folks are really worried about physical protection, uh, employees in parking lots, employees after hours, visitors, you know, that, that's a very valid reason as well. And, and others are simply worried about uh, recording it to, to understand what the movement in their business is, right? So a lot of different reasons that we're seeing folks implement video surveillance today. And then the final component being, do you need it for a response? Do you want to actually live respond to it? Uh, again, we go back to uh, an education campus, for example, post-secondary. A lot of them will put in video surveillance and they've got a security desk and they're monitoring it, and that allows for us to very quickly respond to an incident. Uh, lesser used in, in actual live response situations, more often used for a, a forensic. Something happened, we need to go back and substantiate what happened. There's a difference in, in how you set up your systems, and that's why those are some of the first questions you're going to want to ask yourself. Um, beyond cameras and video surveillance, <clears throat> the next large component that are you know, more often implemented on the front end of solutions is access control. We've all used them, there's badges, you have rights to get into a door, not into another door, based on time of day, based on you know a lot of different reasons. Uh, maybe you've got um, some office that you want locked up due to personnel files and, and things like that. So a lot of different reasons. Uh, very, very common nowadays due to the cost to come out and rekey facilities. We'll see access control certainly in most enterprise businesses. Um, and now we've seen that driven down oftentimes to just a general business <clears throat> for convenience sakes. Um, pricing is 
come down such that even now we're seeing these coffee houses that may have one door, very cost effective and you're able to do that rather than every time you have an employee turn and require to rekey the facility, much less expensive to implement access control. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the next thing being emergency call stations, a lot of folks will say code blue, right? That's a generic term that we hear. That's an actual product, but really you'll see it in the upper right hand portion of the slide there, that, that type of blue tower that you generally will see outdoors or in parking ramps. You may have a light associated with it. You'll have a call box, certainly. We'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about mass notification. Now our slide deck is actually up to date here, but mass notification, what does that mean? Many folks don't understand that. We'll, we'll touch on that, and we'll also touch on areas of refuge. That's becoming far more popular and uh, required in many districts. That's what we'll talk about today. Uh, we'll, we'll touch a little bit on metal detectors and x-rays, as well as the, the most recent part of what we're finding in our physical security group is cell phone extenders. Um, if you're in a building that your cell phone doesn't reach, uh, that's actually nowadays due to the mass notifications and that uh, becoming a requirement. So we'll, we'll touch a little bit on that as well. All right, well, there, there's our items. Um, so video surveillance made simple, right? Usually. Uh, you, you start with somebody trying to tie in knots and throwing a bunch of words and scenarios out to you, and, and it's not simple. They make it not simple. Video surveillance at its core is super simple. If you put yourself in a position in your business and what you see, a set of eyes with your range being about 140 degrees most often, that's what video surveillance is. So we'll, we'll, we'll pull out all the complexity of it and really talk about the core component what makes a successful video surveillance solution. Many times people will put cameras in. Here's an example, a very common example of what somebody did. But the, the reality is, what do any of those pictures do for you? If you look at them and go, what were they trying to accomplish? Sure, cameras were put up in the, in the areas, but the one with cubes, you know, what, what does that do? That doesn't, you'll see in the bottom right-hand side, there's the little two-wheeler dolly there, well, you're not able to see who's bringing product in and out. You're certainly not able to see the top of the frame with the door, uh, so you might catch a couple of people walking throughout. You're not seeing anybody at the cubes. That camera might as well not even have it there. The top right here, you know, you'll see the parking lot. You're not seeing any of the cars down below. Let's say a larger truck parks in that second spot. You're now not going to see any of the video. Third slide, in between cars. Again, unless it's those two very particular spots that you're driving people to, no value in that solution there. And finally, you know, the front door gets whitewashed. It's not a white dynamic camera. You're not able to see anything. So effectively, some money was spent there by somebody and, and there's really no value. So we'll talk about that. All right, so video surveillance, principal components and questions. First, well, we're going to talk about every time that, that we're engaged with you uh, about what you're looking for. It's going to be, why do you even need it or want it? You've got to answer that question first. Then the very next step you're going to talk about is cameras, right? What type of quality? A lot of times in the past you'll have 760 or you know, 4 miss and things like that. You hear a lot of different terms, but pretty much nowadays you're going to hear everything in high def quality. I would say, and what we're seeing in practice, is nothing less, rarely less than four megapixel in uh, cameras, and we'll talk about the why to that in a moment, or eight megapixel. Eight megapixel most oftentimes is thought of uh, HD 4K type of quality. And then you have to make a decision on a dome camera that you put in the ceiling, or a PTZ, which is a pan tilt zoom. Uh, field of view becomes very important, and then a little bit about brands, right? So, we'll, you know, we'll cover the, the why four megapixel or greater cameras. Because if you've got a large enterprise business and you may be concerned about bandwidth, because remember, this is IP. Most people get a little bit of challenge on the storage components and the cost of storage or really their network bandwidth. Well, you can take any camera, such as a four megapixel or a 4K camera, and you can compress the, the streams that are coming out of it, right? So in the past, we've used motion JPEG and it would be very thick on your network. We're now using H.264 or the newest codec coming out and becoming more widespread with H.265. That allows us to use very little bandwidth and certainly reduces storage. If it's still too much for your network, you can simply run compression on those cameras and run them with less information onto your network. 
So I would not would highly, highly recommend to not buy a camera of lesser quality because your network supports it. Buy the, the higher quality, $20 or $30 more, and you're able to compress it, use it as today, and then as your network matures, you're able to turn up, uh, use less compression, get more data. So that, that's why there. Um, the PTZ pan tilt zooms uh, are not being used that much, nearly as much anymore as they used to. Typically, you're going to want a live view situation. So if you're a college campus or a you know government agency that has a security desk, or the other areas that we see them oftentimes are in retail, and you've actually got loss prevention people really looking in and following people, that's when pan tilt zooms are, are used more often. Price point has come down significantly on those. Megapixels have gone up. Usually you're going to find two or three megapixel max on those, but you're going to get a much better zoom. So if we're covering those areas, uh, a pan tilt zoom would be very good. If not, what you may want to consider is taking in two lesser price cameras that are less than 50%, usually about a quarter of the cost of a pan tilt zoom, and you're able to get greater coverage. So now you're getting full-time views from those cameras at a lesser cost. Granted, you need an extra license typically on the system, but again, by the time you cable it, use your switchboard, pay for the license and the device, you're you know, 25 to 35 percent of the cost of what a pan tilt zoom, and you're getting your full-time view. So those are some of the, the questions that you're going to want to really think about as you design your system. And brand, if you have a brand preference, there's a, there's a lot of different brands out there, um, but it comes down to the optics of them. And so if you you, know, you should be able to ask for either a demonstration of the camera or a remote connectivity to one to really understand what they look like. It's a lot of really good uh, product out there at a, a very competitive price nowadays. So those would be, and typically on a, a fixed camera, you're going to get anywhere from 90 to 109 degree view. So you can cover 180 degrees uh, very, very easily, full time, high megapixel, good quality um, views there. After the camera, you're really going to look at your software, right? So software solutions uh, are the software slash hardware, but the software component of it is how do you view? What are you viewing? Uh, does it have an app so you can see it from your phone? Are you able to share it with your authorities? How do you move it? Um, so product that, that Marco uses quite a bit are March Networks, Milestone Systems, Vigilon, right? And they can be a VM instance that you can put on your own VM, or you can match it up with some, you know, for lack of a better term, NVR, uh, previously known as DVR type devices. So you've got a lot of uh, options there that you didn't have just a couple of years ago. Um, one thing I want to mention here is the software solution is typically about 10% of the overall cost. Okay, So when you're buying a whole solution with your cameras, your storage, your hardware, your, your um, infrastructure, your implementation, the software is only about 10%. So Many times people will put that decision aside and go, well, let's focus on the higher dollar amounts. The challenge when you do that is your long-term cost of ownership is affected most directly by your software. The integrations you can do, the time that it takes your people to look at things and, and what it costs uh, for an ongoing maintenance plan. So I, I encourage you to, even though it's 10% of the solution, look long and hard because that's how you're going to interface with it and that's going to drive your long-term cost. The other component you'll look at is storage. Is it an NVR, right? Is it an appliance-based solution? Um, three or four years ago, I'd say unless you're a small enterprise, you know, I would move to a SAN type solution. Nowadays, they're, they're growing up quite a bit in their capabilities and their ability to integrate and, and you know, put multiple NVRs together to give you a seamless solution. So it's, it's come back around as a very viable option. Or do you use your corporate SAN, right? Uh, do you have a, a Dell product, you have, you know, any one of the, you know, big iron products. Um, many folks like to use that because they've got one option and one component to learn and to maintain. Um, I challenge most people to look at the at the cost of ownership of that though, because those enterprise SANs compared to the video optimized SAN, um, quite a large difference in performance as well as again cost of ownership. There are products out there one product that Marco uses quite a bit is a product called Pivot 3, P-I-V-O-T 3. That's a video optimized SAN. Get a lot of, lot of, you know, terabytes to petabytes at a, a very competitive price, and it handles the, the, the weight of what video surveillance is. Keep in mind, most SANs are meant to read and write, read and write throughout the day. 
um, a video fan is, you know, recording video is right, 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 right intensive, so it really beats up uh, your SAN. So that's why you should have a video optimized SAN. Which one's right for you? Uh, there's not a right answer of what solution is right. There's only a right answer of what's right for your organization. And some of the things that you're going to look at is how many days you want to record. Understand, you know, many people say, I want 60 days. Is it a compliance issue? Is it a, an internal issue? Is it because the number sounds good? You, you really should understand how many days you want, both on the front end, plus you're going to have to look at how many cameras you're going to have, uh, as it says on the third point there, today and tomorrow. So you, you need to build that. Is your SAN able to be expanded or is your NVR able to be expanded? An important question, again, for your long-term possible ownership. And what's your infrastructure look like? Does your, do your switches handle it? And do you have um, VLANs on your network, right? Important things that you're going to want to pay attention to. Um, and then other things are, you know, do you want public monitors, right? Do you, are, you know, we've all seen them when we walk into a retail space and there's a monitor up. You know, that's an important piece, but it drives the camera and what type of camera you put in. We'd like to see those with uh, HDMI compatible, so you can just plug in. It's a simple implementation. And it's going to prevent a lot of issues because people know that you've got it. Again, it goes back to forensic or live view. And most people would rather uh, avoid an issue and just let people know they're being recorded and stop it from the get-go, let them go down to the neighbor next door and uh, do whatever they're going to do down there, right? All right. And then the other component is really uh, you've got to pay attention to the motion that you've got. What percent of motion? You know, a lot of people say, well, it's 50% of the time we're closed. That's great. So right out of the shoot, you've only got 50% motion. However, what nobody ever talks about is when is that motion happening, right? Think of a school. And in a school situation, 50 minutes of the hour, very low, just the kid going back and forth to the nurse or administrator walking down the hallway, very low motion. Uh, but that 10 minutes in between classes, extremely high motion. And that's what we've got to look at. So even though that might be 15% motion, that 15% is going to kill your system if you don't uh, configure it correctly. So again, very important for those things. These are, I'm just kind of going through what we're seeing out in the field and, and why you may uh, want to make one decision or the other or just ensure that you've got good, solid questions that you're able to ask for your organization as we move through. And then in regard to that motion and analytics as well, uh, is it server-based or is it edge-based? So you can do two different things. You can have back to the camera decision. You can choose to run those on, on the edge and have your camera require that po processing power. Or you can choose to do it on the server, which requires a beefier server and component like that. Not a right answer. Again, just a question to ask yourself. All right. So that covers us on the kind of the high-level topics of video surveillance. Now we'll talk a little bit about access control. Access control is uh, popping up everywhere nowadays. It used to be enterprise business. Um, nowadays, schools are a great one, right? We've got almost uh, every school district we're working with, they're locking down the entrances, right? You've got to start controlling the flow of people in your business, whether it's an education, government facility, or just a, a traditional business, right? We do a lot of car dealerships, and car dealerships are locking everything down and controlling who goes where. There's a lot of just people around, and uh, somebody may accidentally just walk into a room that they shouldn't. Um, but you'll see by the slide here, access control, there's a lot of components to it, right? By nature and by basic what we're doing, it's super simple, right? Uh, but really, this comes down into the, the thought pattern and the process that your business is going through to implement it. And, um, you know, it's, it's really difficult if, if you start looking at it. It's very difficult to get your arms around the process to people who should have what access and when. And when you have change of employees, how do you manage that change? You can't just turn around and hand your card to somebody else. What happens if they leave? What happens if you need an immediate lockdown? How do you move that? So that's the, the process, and that's where I would say uh, you need to spend the most of your time within the access control. You know, the reality is it's dry contacts and closures, and, and when we move to, uh, you know, implement it, we're just managing, you know, is there juice to a strike, right? But again, the process of how you get to that point is what's most important. The technology itself is pretty simple. Um, you know, there's, as you move into a now, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but you'll see workstations. Is somebody actually monitoring that? You'll see video monitors. Again, are you showing people entrances and exits? 
video router, again, back to the front end of the conversation, everything's going to be IP-based nowadays. So what does that look like to your network? Where are you sharing the information? Do you have multiple sites? How do we manage, you know, five different sites with one set of software so that you only need one card, right? We do a lot with a large hospital chain here, and they've got 15 different hospitals, 80 different clinics, and all these parking ramps, and they don't want to have a different card for each component. So what's your enterprise look like? Is it two doors and it's pretty straightforward, single site, or is it multiple site and multiple buildings, right? Um, are you going to carry a badge, so your access control badge? You know, do you want a key fob that you carry on a keychain, or do you want a badge where you actually print on it and look? Uh, there's a different cost, of course, of the badge if you're going to print, and then if you print single-sided or double-sided. Again, all these thoughts and process, and, and when we're working with you, we're going to go through all these questions, and we've got forms, and, and we really fill it out to, to get around our arms around what your, your organization really truly needs. Um, are you going to integrate video? Are you going to have an x-ray machine and a metal detector? All of those things. Most of that time it's, hey, I've got X, X number of doors, I just want to control that. Then we're going to drive into who the people are and what, what the reason is. Um, you know, actually I'm going to go back to this previous slide for one moment. You'll see readers there and I want to talk a little bit about what's at the door, right? So what's at the door is your reader. Your, what you'll hear is Rex, request for exit. If you're going to use your software to do reports and understand if somebody had a, an unauthorized entrance, then you need to wire a Rex to it. So it requires a port cable. All this cable, by the way, is not even category cable. It's low voltage cable, 18.2, 18.4, and 18.6. So inexpensive cable, and, uh, but you, ha you have to make sure you run them. You put your gear at the head end, so your processors, your connections to the network, and your battery backup goes into the head end, typically a data room. And at the door, you've got your, your racks, your request for exit. You've got your reader, which you're actually uh, opening and you know, giving the authorization to. You've got your electric strike or bag lock, and you've got your contact to show the position of that door. So again, low voltage out to the door, a little bit of implementation, everything's in place, and then you really uh, designing the rules. Um, as we get into that rule set, you're going to want to think about, you know, we strongly recommend that you create groups of folks. Likewise, if it's administrative, if it's executive, if it's sales, if it's service, whatever types of employees that you have, you group them. Uh, strongly recommended not to assign individual rights to each person because it gets out of control. But if you create groups and you drop the people in the groups and you layer them on, very easy to control, very easy to change general permission, very easy to say if somebody has 24-hour access or, or you know, holiday uh, abilities. So part of the design process, but the one point that most people miss, and it makes uh, ongoing administration of your access control system much, much simpler. All right. Um, so now in regard to why do people implement access control systems, what do we think? Provide controlled access to the facility. Easiest example of that is, again, an educational facility, a school, right? Um, where they used to be able to walk in and go inside the door and get to the re, you know, main receptionist area or walk to the gym. Uh, not, not possible, should not be possible today, and really not uh, on any level recommended, right? We've got control access to the facility or a hospital facility, and you can't have them in the men's room or the, you know, um, bad materials room, things like that, or a financial, um, you know, you can't have folks walking into the back rooms where the tellers are and things like that. Um, allows access to authorized personnel. Um, and with the access control system, we, we, again, ask that you create a security protocol and policy that you administer and, and you know, maintain and use going forward, then you also share it with your, your folks and your employees and maybe even post it for visitors. Uh, it's just really part of the process. You can do certain things, but unless you're sharing that out with your folks and unless you actually have a policy in place, it, it usually goes nowhere. Um, and what we'll cover on those automated enhanced identification process, printing on badges. Easy to do. Most printers to do that, two-sided color printer, you know, $2,000 or so, so not terribly expensive for what it allows you to do. And, and if you, again, create that policy and require people to, to wear that, um, people feel a little bit empowered and they'll actually stop people in the hallway and say, hey, you have a badge. 
strongly recommended there for for securing a facility because in the end it's all about awareness right and how do you increase awareness for your employees your visitors and and other folks um personnel tracking we can get into rfid and understanding who is where or we can understand and do reports on who went through what door at what time a lot of a lot of ability to do that certainly important when you're you know have outside visitors in your facility such as contractors and vendors um, and then all the reporting nowadays again it's, it's all of this is ip related so you've got the data on your network you, once you have the data uh, as you know you can do whatever you want with that so and again we mentioned in the, the coffee house uh, example but if you have to rekey a facility, whether it's one lock and getting a, a locksmith out there, whether you have multiple locks and have to rekey a whole facility, terribly, terribly expensive. So many times uh, that's a good point to implement an access control system if you're able to reduce those costs moving forward. And then just controlling the flow of the people in a building. Um, this is one of the things, many times for a building people, employees will park wherever they want, right? And, and employers and administration gets super frustrated with that. Well, when you allow their car at certain times of the day, it only allows them certain doors, guarantee you it stops them from parking on the other side of the building, right? They're not going to walk in December across the parking lot to go to a door. Um, so you're able to really control the flow within your own building. A um, little bit more about that. It eliminates the needs to have a body manning all access, takes control of your site. Um, I think all of this is pretty self-explanatory, right? Uh, maybe a little bit about the ability to lock down entire areas. Uh, many times now, again, community centers, buildings, courthouses, uh, banks, all, all these sites we're putting in, for lack of a better term, a panic button. So you can put buttons in to, to do many different things and, and you know, there's a lot of different buttons and it doesn't matter to us, again, because it's just a, a uh, contact uh, that you're in a relay. But you can have a button where somebody can hit that button and immediately lock down your facility. If that quickly, you can lock all doors. So if it's a, you know, shouldn't be and they see something going on, hit that button, you're done. And there has to be a procedure to take that out of lock. Or you can, you know, put a camera up there, allow you to see somebody at an entrance, maybe put a speaker and talk to them and choose to hit the button to release and open a single door. So whether it's locking down a group or single door or groups of doors, whether it's unlocking a single door or groups of doors, you have that ability with the touch of a button. So, and, and we can do that on a, on a cell phone as well. So your ability to move about your facility and, and make the decisions on who's coming and who's going and then locking it down and, and only giving authorities the access, it's, it's literally a, a, a wire, a $50 button or a $30 button and you know, a couple more minutes worth of programming. That simple to do. All right. The other thing that we don't see too often, but um, as we're getting a little bit tighter on things, eliminating the buddy system. So we talk about it, we joke sometimes that, well, five people, you know, you're nice, you're a gentleman, you open the door and let five people walk through. All right. Well, what does that do for the control of the building? So there are simple systems out there where you can eliminate the buddy system and it will alarm if, you know, more than one person comes through that. So tailgating many times is what that does. Uh, that's known as in the industry, right? So, and again, uh, if you're doing it for any compliancy issues, uh, SAS compliancy or anything else, you've got all records there for future litigation. So you're really, you know, controlling your uh, legal issues there. All right, <clears throat> so access control, head end gear. We touched a little bit on this earlier, but the, there's a couple of different components. There's many systems that are made with proprietary uh, hardware, and then there's Mercury-based. There's about 35 companies out there that um, offer a Mercury-based solution, so it's a standards type of board, and you just have a different software on there. So um, the, the system uh, that we've used here for a long time, Open Option, that's a Mercury-based panel. Um, if for some reason in the future you were acquired, you sold, you did something, you decided you didn't want the Open Options hardware, you're able to take another Mercury-based manufacturer, flash the boards, and uh, utilize it there. So again, in, in this software scenario, call it 10% of the solution was the software, uh, but everything else at the door level is all uh, that hardware is able to be used. And then you have to make a decision you want a server-based system or a server-less based system. There's different reasons for that, but uh, uh, if you control that and you do the upgrade, you can have that. If it's a smaller implementation, typically that's a, a cost 
issue. Uh, we're just doing a little implementation and we don't want to pay for a server. Maybe get a little bit less of abilities to do. However, it serves your purpose and controls the door. And then the power. We really like to see it. Um, in the olden days, people would put the power above the door and they would do a little bit of wiring. And now every time you had an issue, you'd have to track it down and go to the door to try to find it. Not the way uh, the industry is trending now. It's move everything into the data room. You can use your UPS systems or, or generators, whatever you have there. It really uh, is much more simple from a troubleshooting standpoint should you ever have an issue and a tracking. So the power goes at the head end. At the door, the reader, you're going to have to make some decisions here too on what type of cards do you want. That's going to drive the type of reader. iClass, that's a, a card that, you know, 2K, 4K, 16K, where you can store information. An example, that's a hospital system that we use. They also have, you know, charge people and, and put credit on there, or school systems, we put credit on their, their the badges and allow people to go to the lunchroom and charge, and it, it stores information or gives other permissions and, you know, photos, just information that you can store on the card for different reasons. That's in an iClass. Of course, the card costs a little bit more. The size of the card, whether it's a 2K or 16K, is going to drive that. Or is it just simple proximity? Be within a range of the door, 8 to 15 inches typically, swipe and go. No iClass, you're not going to be able to store information on there, but your cost of your card is certainly less expensive. So if that's all you're doing, why not have an, a, a prox card? Or a long range. Do you have an overhead door? Do you have a gate where you want to be able to pull up and get within 50 feet of it and have the, the gate or the door open and move through it? You know, your decision there, they're all just standards based, again, based on the situation at hand, door by door by door. The strike. Locksmith needs to put it in. That's what, when you give power to it, releases power, so um, your door opens. Typically, you're going to, on your exterior doors, you will fail secure uh, versus fail safe, right? Fail secure means they're going to stay locked, so you can't get one way, can't get out, or can't get in, right? But you can still get out. Uh, inside, typically, they'll fail safe, which means you can now move within that. Very important to understand that from a uh, an issue if you have a fire, you have a reason that you got to move inside that building. If the strike fails, what do you want to do with it? So understanding that question and not just assuming that they're doing it the right way, because in the end, you carry the liability. So knowing that question becomes very important. And then the contact to tell you whether or not the door is open. Somebody pop, pops the door open, posts, you know, posts it open for the day and decides to come in at night. We can say through the system, if this door is open more than one minute, five minutes, ten minutes, you set the parameters notify me here on my cell phone, text, whatever. So again, that all comes in the design and that's why I talk about how important that design and really understanding how your system operates. Far more important, in my opinion, than the actual hardware um, for long-term maintenance. And then are you going to do any integration with cameras, burglar alarms? Many times people like to swipe their card on the way in and it shuts the burglar alarm off. So different, different components that you just need to make a decision. All right, I know we're moving through it, but uh, it's all designed to make sure you guys uh, have plenty of time for Q&A at the end should you have anything. Emergency call stations, what are they? You see the picture, that's typically what they are. Where you're most often gonna see them, parking lots, parking garages, right? Uh, maybe some hallways for buildings. Uh, there's one other component under areas of refuge we'll talk about in a minute, but that's what they are. Emergency phones that are really a crime deterrent, highly visible. Many times we'll put the, a blue light up on there so that uh, people around you, if that's flashing, you know it's in use. Or just a, a, a light to light up a walkway. They're all going to carry a call box, right? You have to determine what your organization looks like. Does that call happen to your security department? Are you a college or are you a government entity that actually has a live security department? Or does that call go to 911 and really get to an emergency? If it goes to 911, We've got to spend some time with you because you have to send the right information. If you got a big parking lot and you have five of these around your building, we have to send your address, but also where on that complex is this device, so Southwest parking lot. So a little bit of configuration there. Many times people miss and don't uh, understand what happened when they had an emergency and they still couldn't find the person. So that's what they are. Um, really a crime deterrent, makes people feel good. Um, you know, unfortunately, most of the times when we're implementing these is after an event, right? After an assault or something like that, they're going, oh, we should have had that. 
Um, depending upon your ability, do you have power out there? Do you need to run solar power? A little bit more of a challenge up here in the, uh, the north, particularly as we get November, December, and January to get solar power to carry us all day. So um, we just got to understand what does the surrounding area look like? Is it covered by trees or do you need live power? Again, a little bit of decision, simple to do, a little bit of a challenge to implement. You got to have good uh, concrete underneath and they weigh, you know, 400 plus pounds. So you just tip them up with a, with a crane, but uh, that's all designed in the implementation. Then. Now, conversely, if you're in a parking garage, you may just have one that's, you know, two and a half feet tall and is going on a wall. Again, you can integrate a camera, you can integrate a light, still do all the components. It's just no need for a nine foot tower. All right. Um, the, the calling component out of there, the call box, uh, they come in either analog. So if you're going to connect it to your phone system, run an analog extension out to it, it comes off your phone system, easily done. Same thing with SIP. SIP extension off your phone system, good to go. Or if you have cell phone capability, don't have the ability to uh, really get to a phone system, you, you're going to use a call box. That's a cell call box, right? Create a Verizon or an AT&T account, um, put it in there. You have to have the right type of you know, calling station in there, but you just choose which, which carrier you want, put that in there now, there are cell phones, and allows you to test them and, and ensure that you've got good coverage. We'll see those in financial institutions, outside banking areas. Again, not so much in that scenario to, to cover somebody being assaulted, but to really avoid the assault and, and the, the, the rob, the robbing of folks uh, on the front end, right? They see that there, there's a camera, there's a light, there's a call box, and go down the street and get to the next location. Education and government, we see that a lot for students in parking lots. Um, and then the other piece that we'll talk about in a moment is the mass notification, really one-way communication through these. So on a campus, if you've got all of these around, uh, using this, these for a mass notification component, highly recommended and, and most often how it's done. So again, provides two-way communication to emergency services, either your staff or 911 notification. And in the end, it gives peace of mind, right? People just, uh, they, you walk a campus with this and you look around and you see these, it just, you know, brings parents' concerns and students' concerns way down, so. All right, mass notification, it goes, goes back to that. Mass notification is really the platform that sends one-way messages to inform employees and the public of an emergency. So, the, again, back to those uh, emergency towers, you've got them around, Maybe you integrate it with the paging system of your in, in your phone system. We did that. We just recently did that down in a county offices in southern Minnesota. But it's sending one-way messages, audio or text, right? That's really what mass notification is. So if you've got a campus or a, a business enterprise campus, a government facility, you know, with a bunch of employees and education with students, um, you have the ability via mass notification to audibly alert them and track that and give out certain responses, recorded responses, or live live uh, information, or via text as well. So again, usually you're gonna be a paging system and some type of emergency tower, all right? But uh, highly, highly uh, desirable um, in, in many areas. Okay, area of refuge. This is one that, that uh, interestingly enough, uh, most times when we're talking to folks, they don't, they're not even aware of it. So if you are managing or own a multi-story building, think about this. What happens to the folks if you can't use the elevator that don't have the ability to utilize stairs, whether the stairways are closed or physically they can't use the stairs? They're now trapped on different floors um, in weather emergencies, you know, assault emergencies, components like that. Um, what, what do you do? And that's, you have to legally in most areas now, you have to have an area of refuge. That includes signage amongst the floor, identifying an area on each, each and every floor of each and every building where people go in the case of an emergency. You have to sign throughout the building and have that so people know where to go. And then to complete it, you actually have to have a call station. You see a simple call station there. It can be as simple as that, or it can be one of the emergency notifications that have a light. You know, if you're concerned about smoke and things like that, many times it's nice to have a light associated with it. And again, programming that, that it notifies whomever is responding, whether you're sending it to your own group or whether you're sending it to the authorities, notifying them exactly where that is. Here's the address, here's the floor, here's the location, right? So um, 
It's not a very expensive solution, again, because it can be a simple call box and some signs. But I can tell you from experience, if you don't have this in place and you're responsible for the building, the litigious nature of it is quite heavy. So, again, part of the conversation and understanding when you're developing your whole overall physical security plan. All right. So a little bit of notes again just to cover. Final points. High-def cameras, software, and the integrations. Are you going to integrate access control, burglar alarm, use analytics? We're seeing that quite often now. Show me the guy that came in in the red and track him throughout the building, and now it's going to track just that. Again, how quickly can you get to the information that you need? And the storage. You know, as we talked about, whether it's an NVR, whether it's a pivot, whether it's your own plan. But first and foremost, understand why you need video. I view forensic, physical, solve, fact. It kind of covers video access control. Understand your employees, your visitor, and the access levels required, and whether you go first decision, proprietary, or mercury board. Emergency call stations, physical solve. Is there any areas that you have that, have concerns, or quite honestly can market it to your constituents if you've got a group of people that are coming to a building? You put that out there, they feel much better about having that there, an area of refuge. I was going to also talk about here, just touch base on cell phone extenders. Again, where we're really seeing cell phone extenders is if you've got a building, if you can't get cell phone in there, you have to think about from an emergency standpoint, what do you do? A cell phone extender, such as SureCall, is a great product, very well priced, and goes in there. What it does is you put an antenna, you go around the building with a tool, you measure the cell phone coverage outside of the building, and as long as you have good cell phone coverage outside of the building, you can get good cell phone coverage anywhere in the building. What you're doing is you're placing an antenna on the exterior of the building with a specialized cable that comes in, goes to an internal amplifier, and then you wire antennas out. So if you've got a basement and you have zero cell phone coverage, yet it's a highly, we've got some community centers that have daycare and components in their basement, the legal issues they'll have if there is an emergency without being able to get that. So what we've done in those scenarios is we put it in, we wire it, maybe it's a 200-foot long hallway, it's an L-shape, whatever it looks like. We measure the building and understand it's going to take two or three antennas. We put one on the exterior, cable to that, put an amplifier inside, and then extend out antennas from there. Now all you've done is taken that cell phone signal, bring it inside, amplify it, and now you have full cell phone coverage. Whether it's cell phone, whether it's AT&T, Verizon, understand which ones you want, and then also understand if you're looking for data. Very easily done, measured out by the manufacturers, and a little bit of amplifiers and some cabling, and now you've got yourself covered from that standpoint. Last and most interesting for timing of this meeting is an event coming up in March, State Point 2019, being sponsored by Marco and a couple of other folks, large educational entities. March 19th, over at the McNamara Alumni Center at the U of M, from 8 to 3, an event coming up, and there'll be breakout sessions covering for education, government, financial, banking, enterprise business, and then you'll get to meet with some vendors. So, you know, March Networks or a Milestone or an Invigilant, if you actually want to see the product and understand it and compare, that's going to be a really good spot to do it. You want to see what these emergency towers look like. These folks will be there and you're able to get your arms around it. We really strongly recommend that you get to know your manufacturer and the representatives from the manufacturer versus just your integrator implementing the solution. It makes for much better two-way communication, protects you and your facilities much better. You're going to have access to these folks there. 8 o'clock, there will be continental breakfast, then there will be a keynote speaker, and then there will be four sets of sessions with about six breakouts in each of those sections, so plenty of time to view all the ones that are important to you and really cover your physical security along with there's going to be some folks there talking logical security as well. We recognize that many times the same person is responsible for their physical security as well as logical security, so why not bring all of the security under one event. 350 total spots available, no charge to people attending, but it will absolutely, without question, fill up extremely fast. So if folks are interested, because we're doing this today, I thought, you know, we'll 
uh, let you guys know if you want to email me and say, hey, you know, we'd really like to go to that. Um, the open invitation will probably go out first week of January, but if you uh, let me know about it now, we'll put you on a list, we'll reserve it and, and uh, email you when it, when it comes out. I'll probably allow you the week ahead of time to register. Make sure you guys are covered on that and then we'll open up general registration. So feel free to email me and uh, let me know. We'll hold on to it and, and let you know at the end of December, uh, right before the actual invites go out to the public. All right, thanks. So now um, we'll see here if there's any questions. All right, well, we're good to go. Thanks, guys.